call this police and fire meeting to order at 7 o'clock on July 9th. Uh, Ms. Barbie, do you want to talk about some code issues first? That we, uh, we'll get to. <coughs> All right, so the packet that I gave you guys, we'll start with the vacant building registration. Um, so currently the city has a vacant building registration code, and I attached that to the packet. Um, it's chapter 9, 17. However, there's no fees. When you go back to fees, this was passed in 2010. Um, the fee says a vacant property registration form and registration fee shall be filed with the city manager. Fees for the registration of vacant property shall be established by a separate ordinance. So there was never a separate ordinance um, created. So that gives me the opportunity to try to use this as a tool um, to provide data to our office, to provide revenue to the city, and to provide an incentive for the property owner for maintenance. Um, what happens when you have vacant buildings is they drain on communities and the citizens. They increase pro crime, decrease property values, and negative impact on the quality of life. So the, ba the vacant building registry is a tool growing in popularity. So I did some research and also spoke to a few offices in Ohio and there's a lot of cities that's using this fee as a way to uh, control where it's unoccupied and businesses that have been unoccupied for a period of time. Um, so I'll just read some of this and try to know, some main topics and some discussion. Um, so, so registration can also provide a revenue stream to help with direct municipal cost of vacancies. So the vacant buildings in the city right now, is the city mows the grass, is the city cleans the debris up and boards up currently, um, and we don't have the fee to cover that, like we if we chose to go vacant registration fee route. Right now, we're attaching it to the taxes, but sometimes those taxes aren't being paid. So the city can go years without getting any kind of revenue. Um, building registration imposes a fee to cover administrative costs of processing the paperwork, cost of boarding up, and mowing lawns. Vacant buildings have a significant cost in a struggling city, and of course, our city's struggling. But far bigger costs are those of fighting fires and dealing with crime while vacant buildings as the setting where the stash of stolen goods are stored. So there's been many buildings I've went into since I've worked here where some of the vacant buildings have stored motorcycles that's been stolen, uh, drugs, uh, computer parts have been, I've, I've seen computer uh, hard drives in some of these buildings. So just, just different types of stuff where folks have stolen and stashed in those buildings. Um, the city of Nelsonville currently has no annual fee. And the code and zoning office would like the consideration of council to impose a vacant building registration fee using a gradual scale in which the annual fees increase every year that the property is vacant. Uh, hopefully, if we impose this, um, we, we can recoup some of the loss that the citizens paying property taxes and paying, you know, monies to the city to take care of the city can recoup those loss. Um, vacant buildings never get better on their own, so the goal should be a speedy reuse when vacancy does occur. And then it talks about the reasons why maybe. Buildings are vacant in the city. Um, and then on the back page, I have the fees. And so if you just flip the page over, 
So the fees described in this section are established in order to defray the cost to the city government community as a whole related to the health, safety, and impacts of structures, which remain vacant for a period of time, including but not limited to administrative costs for registering and processing the vacant buildings. Um, the owner of registration form is by the city and monitoring the vacant building sites. The fees are also structured in order to provide appropriate incentives for owners of vacant buildings to care for their property, seek to fill them, and in appropriate cases, demolish them. The annual increase fee amounts are intended to absorb the cost of the city for demolition, hazard abatements, of care to vacant buildings, as well as the continued formal administrative costs stated above. And a owner of a vacant building shall pay a fee of $100 for the first year the building remains vacant. For every consecutive year that the building remains vacant, an annual fee will be assessed at double the previous year's fee amount for a maximum annual fee equaling the five-year fee of $1,600 to be used for the fifth and for all consecutive years of vacancy. The first annual fee shall be paid at the time the building is registered. If the owner successfully restores the building to occupancy or demolishes it in accordance with the applicable city code during the first year following registration and is renewed in a timely fashion and there has been no violation associated the fee shall be refunded less than administrative charge equal to 5% of the amount refunded. The fee shall be paid in full prior to assurance of any of the main demographics unless the property is granted for exemption. All the fees shall be paid by the owner prior to any transfer, <coughs> transfer of any ownership increasing in the vacant building. A lien may be placed on the property to collect the delinquent fees. And then absent a, a showing of good cause, if a building is not registered within the time frame required in, and then we're going to put the, the code section, or the registration is not renewed within 30 days after it expired in one year from the date of the <coughs> And the penalty shall be paid in addition to the annual registration fee. The penalty shall be equal to one half of the current annual fee or $1,000 less. Um, so that's So the real goal is code compliance and prevention of further decline of any unoccupied buildings. Um, so I think ramping up the pressure of vacant building registration fee helps provide an incentive for the owner to figure out what their problem is. Um, I think it gives also the owner a shove in the direction of selling the building if they can't afford to take care of the building. Um, I can give many examples and I can give many of the citizens complaints of the city that they're just tired of living the side of a building that is vacant and there's crime, there's the grass is five foot tall. Um, and then let's be honest, the city doesn't have the money to pay the buildings. I mean, code enforcement has a very limited budget currently to do board up, uh, to do mowing. Right now, we have about 22 code enforcement grant properties. We don't have a lot of money for that. As a matter of fact, when I 
charge it to the taxes, a lot of times we don't even see that <clears throat> come back to the to the city. So we're losing lots and lots of money. Um, I think this encourages putting this, and it's a substantial amount. I get that, but putting that on the backs of putting a vacant building on the backs of the taxpayers isn't fair when it should the property owner that is paying the city to take care of it or encourage them to get rid of it if they're holding it for a later date, thinking they're going to make money if they sell it, thinking, you know, I buy a building, $10,000, a rental building. They're going to go into the rental business, right? They, get, they start working on the building and they realize, I don't have the money to take care of this. So we just going to let it sit here for about five years. And then grass, you know, we get busted out, we get crime, it might catch on fire. So then we got to, like, the, the trailers down on Toad Drive, those are burnt trailers set for over a year that's right on the bike path. And nothing the city doesn't have money to take care of them. I think that if we put this on the back of the property owners, then they'll take responsibility. <coughs> In their so, so, I'm, not, I'm, residential, yes. okay. I'm talking about across the board residential, commercial, any building that's sitting vacant for any length of time. I, I think we need to address the blight, and this is a, a lot of cities are using it. Another thing people are doing is they get in the business, they buy a house, they get in the rental business. And they said, you know, I don't want to deal with the tenants anymore. They tear up my house and I want to deal with it. I'm just going to sit. And then sell to somebody that's willing to use the property to rent. Um, and, and I'm seeing work, and I'm getting more and more citizen complaints about these vacant buildings. They're tired of the vacant buildings uh, in the neighborhood and all the, you know, rats. Possums. So I get so many calls about buildings that are just left vacant and not being taken care of. And I think that this money help the city be able to do more with the buildings. And if if, if they has entered the conference, maybe they like I'm not paying the city this much money. I'm going to sell it. And then somebody will get it useful to. Them. So, and I know it's a huge topic. I know that, you know, there's a lot at stake, but I'm just talking to the folks that call me and say, I'm tired of this vacant building in my neighborhood. It's causing a lot of problems. Well, <laughs> So, so the city's struggling during COVID as well, but we're still mowing the grass. We're still boarding up the, you know, we're still doing what's right for the community. Yeah, I mean, before the city, at 22 properties, that'd be $1,100 per cut. Now, I mean, that was a lot of money. I mean, that's well, each cut. But every time you swipe. right, I assess that to the property taxes, and we just got our um, our monies for the second. I think the second half of the year, Taylor was telling me, and I asked how much of that was code enforcement assessments, and it was very little. Almost, I don't even think it was a hundred dollars from last year's grass mowing. Doing all that. Yeah, and we paid how much to the guy last year? He wants to feel up. Oh, it hasn't been there. Oak Oak, Oak Golden Top. Right. There's three lots. There's a field. At the top of where Clinton meets up? Right. No, on the other end. By Grover. Got it. There's, there's, there's not that tall. Yeah. 
Right there, yeah. where the road does the. I'm yeah, actually on the other side. I, I well. would have to, yeah, we'd have to. It was an older lady who owned them, I believe she passed. Habitat talked about getting their empty. There was trailers and all trailers. So, I'm sorry, when he's looking, I, I just want to say that we have currently <laughs> two vacant registrations for this year in the city. Only two. They're supposed to renew every year. We've only had two properties register their property as vacant. So our current our current code is not encouraging people to register their properties. As a matter of fact, they're avoiding the matter and there's no fee attached to it so why does it even matter and and part of that is to, to register you you have to have insurance on your property even if it's vacant and that property insurance is way more expensive than you know if it's occupied yeah so really right now our program is not working it's not helping us with our issues with blight. So my goal for 2020 is to address blight, condemn buildings, get this vacant registration uh, working for the city. Because right now it's not really working for us. It's a code that's only giving a couple people, you know, the honest people are registering their buildings. The other folks are like, you know, the code reads six months vacant. It needs to be registered with the city. And you guys can go around the city and see all the vacant buildings. And there, there's only two that's that's registered. So that's something else I want to say as well. Uh, we need to use we need to use the tools that we have, add on to the tools, make sure there's no loopholes where people can say, well, here's a loophole. I'm gonna I'm going to work this angle and try to get out of my responsibility of doing what I need to do. And then it goes on the backs of the citizens that have their properties kept up, that care about their community. You know? So, I mean, <laughs> to answer your question, it says those lots belong to an individual who's deceased. Yeah, I'm not going to say the name, but I found them up there. That's what I thought it was. Uh, this tool also will only work if I enforce it. I've been hired to do my job as the code officer and enforce the city code, right? And you guys know that I'm doing that. So if this passes, it will be enforced, I promise. Okay. Um, and so the only thing I don't know about is. Like our square, it's a bunch of vacant spaces. And until we come up with a plan, we can bring them down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Some in there. I think that's the job of the property owner. If I have a vacant building, what's my incentive to get it full? What's my incentive to keep it vacant? Which outweighs? Is it more of an incentive for me to keep it? empty? Is it more of an incentive to fill it up? So I think the incentive of these folks that have these vacant buildings are all different across the board. True. Does, does Athens and Logan have this? I'm just um, I don't think Athens has a problem because once they get a building empty, it gets right. full pretty quick. You know, Athens, I think it's hard to compare Nelsonville to Athens it is. with this. It is. You can. No, I'm just curious. This it's is. a vibrant town. That's my question. <laughs> has declined over the years and I think filling these buildings up will create a more vibrant town Absolutely. so and the only way to do it we can't keep saying well we got to wait on somebody that wants to come into town those property owners need to be out trying to find individuals and do what needs to take to, and in order to do that you have to have some pressure i think on some of the property owners to say okay i'm going to pay 1600 dollars on the fifth year my building's vacant to the city why would i want to do that i could be spending 600 dollars elsewhere 
You know what? I mean? so it's an incentive to get people rolling. Right yeah. Am I live to answer to ask a question? I don't have a problem with it. We've had a discussion on it. Branch council will let get everyone to put on it. Will the twenty seventh be fine? Sure. I'm taking this because, topic to finance because next the thirteenth well. is Monday. Uh -huh. Yeah, bring finance for the for the go over the. Yep. I believe. Am I bringing that tonight to finance at eight o'clock? Right. All right, that'll work. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Okay, the on next finance. one. The next yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. The next one is the anti scavenging law uh, code. <laughs> yeah. So Hello. this provision prohibits a person from tampering or sorting through material placed at the curbside for collection. Is basically why we're wanting, I, you know, I get a lot of complaints of folks saying, someone's dug through my trash and it's scattered all over my lawn. Am I going to get a, a code enforcement warning or citation? I didn't do this. Somebody did, somebody did it in the middle of the night. Um, and it's not necessarily animals. So what this, there's two options, and I wrote out both options um, with different wording. Um, one, the first option is no person shall scavenge or remove any part of rubbish or recyclable material from rubbish or recyclable material set out for pickup at any residence, not his or her own, within the city unless given permission to do so by the person occupying or having charge of such premises. Uh, whosoever violates this is guilty of scavenging a minor misdemeanor and upon conviction there will probably find an amount not exceeding $150 for each violation. Number two option is no person other than an employee of the city or waste contract re retained by the city in performance of their duties shall tamper with or sort through garbage, refuge, or recyclable materials placed outside for collection. The reason why I did two options was because there was multiple towns that had it worded differently. So, um, True. What do you think somebody's going to say is cut scavenging? Well, I have their permission. Yeah. Well, they'll have to prove that from the property owner that they have their permission. Because a lot of the property owners are like, I didn't give that person permission to rummage through my dumpster. And we see dumpsters. Uh, I hate to call it dumpster diving, but it is. We see dumpster diving a lot. And say, I don't know, Tony, can I use you as an example? Sure, At your business, if you have a dumpster, <laughs> if you have a dumpster and you gave an individual the okay to go in and recycle the material out of your dumpster, that's kind of different than someone that's going in and Tony didn't give him the permission. Yeah, give everybody permission. Yeah, because that becomes a liability. Yeah, you know, they get hurt. That does. Yeah. So well, and like I said, we get a multitude of calls all the time. What am I going to do? What can I do? I've heard this a lot too. So I think this is a really good thing because we have a unfortunate problem with that right now. And there's and I caught somebody in the day in a dumpster, and I just crossed my arms and sat on my fender and. Gave him the overbearing stare, and he just had to turn around and say, Is this your dumpster? And I went, Yep. Yeah. And right. he went, Okay. I think option two, then? I, I think option two, you know, more, dry. more cut and dry. Um, I really think that, you know, there, there's a thing where, like you said, you, you Allow people to get in that curve. Next thing you know, you know, we have enough needles, we have enough problems in the city as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to in my dumpsters. Mm -hmm. uh, True. So, so you know, if there's needles in somebody's home trash, sure. You're they're a diabetic. Or, yeah, I'm sure. not saying they're yeah. drug have to, diabetic. To that stuff yeah. The city, don't yeah, we we have a. Next thing you know, homeowners getting sued by a homeless person going, oh, oh, I have a place to live now. Yeah. Right now, I think the current practice in the city is homeowners are told that they have to have a photo. Right. They have to have proof that the individual was in their trash. Um, 
and well, with the scavenging wall would be the same thing. They would have to see who's in there. Right, but um, that also gives an officer because I, I oh, more gives a presence. It gives an officer authority when he sees somebody getting in a dumpster hey. at one o'clock in the morning at the car wash down from me, mm -hmm. which I see him all the time. I've yelled at him before, mm -hmm. and they just look at you like, you know what? Whatever. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, we've got people that. I've talked to Rumpke and it's been reported to me that there's been multiple times that Rumpke has pulled up to the dumpster people and there. there's been people in there and they've <clears throat> picked it up to lift it up to dispose of it in the back of the truck and there's someone jumping out the side. We have a call guy. We're uh, able to take a break and see if we can get it to actually come on. Caller, are you able to hear us? Yes. Yes, I am. Caller, can you hear us? Yes, yes. I'm here. Can I ask my question? Caller, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes. That's what I'm going to do. Give me one second. Okay, can I start my question? Well, where is everybody? Okay, are you there? Can I start my question? Well, I will try it. Where did it go? Well, let's try it. My name is Lois McDonald. I live at 1024 Poplar Street. I've lived here for 71 years. My biggest complaint is the empty house, the Freer Golden Swagger house. It's been. Go ahead with your question, ma'am. Yes, yes. My name is Lois McDonald, 1024 Poplar Street. I've been here for 71 years. And we, I constantly have issues with 1031. It's been vacant for seven years. And I'm wondering, the weeds are as high as the roof. There's multiple needles from the mess heads. My property value is going down. I bought a security camera. My neighbor has found snakes. I don't like that. Why could, what could we do about this property? Is there any solution to this problem? Related properties. And full support of the prosecuting office, our city manager and council, as well as the So these are things that are getting caught up that were neglected for years. Can I mention something? Lois, um, if yes. you would come in in the morning and do a records request on that property, I can give you. Uh, information at that point on the process of what code's doing with that property. Okay. It's been seven years and it's getting it's getting nerve wracking. So I will do that, Becky. She's listening. Uh, 
I'll talk to you in the morning. Okay, thank you. Well, McDonald. She was. She was listening, and then was had the, left the conference. Her answer. But I'm talking about she was listening to Facebook or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. All right. New equipment's on the way. So number two is is where you guys are looking at, or what you're looking I, at. I think so. I think I just take some liability off of everybody. And, sure. and I think number two and sees them, they can go ahead and process it right down there. Okay. We'll All send right. It, send that off to council. The next. Um, that would be the twice over. Okay. And that can go through two readings. I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. The next topic is camping. So um, the term camp or camping shall mean the use of public property as a temporary or placement, or permanent placement of dwelling, lodging, or residence, or as a living accommodation at any time, or the sojourn indicated of Camping may include, but not limited to, storage of personal belongings, carrying on cooking activities, or making a fire in an unauthorized area, or any of these activities <coughs> in combination with one another, or in com combination with either sleeping or making preparations to sleep, including the laying down of bedding for the purpose of sleeping. Um, a, it shall be unlawful for any person to camp or dwell in tents, shacks, automobiles, carts, recreational vehicles, campers, or any other temporary shelter for the purpose of overnight camping on any streets, sidewalks, city park facility, or other public-owned places to the determinant of public travel or convenience, vacant lot, part or plot of lands except designated area within the corporation limits of the city. So that would solve a lot of problems that happened last year. Mm -hmm. Especially the tents that were set up on Canal for, for how long? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually doing that one as well. So another, um, another piece to that is We've got a couple folks in the area that's wanting to build camping facilities. So currently right now, I think Bernie Roll has a campground. Mm -hmm. um, Hawking College is in the process of creating a campground. Um, and they're really both good locations because they're not next to the square or in the heart of the, town. the town. Right. Um, but, I think if no, this, that's a little different. So you know, so they'll get their campground set up legally. And, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think if the city in the future goes toward uh, four wheeler or ATV friendly, then this will be also an outlet for t tourists that are coming in to ride their ATVs. A lot of them have campers through our city streets. Well, I'm saying that. About the camping, not about. I'm saying if it becomes four wheeler friendly, so this is a friendly. They can, they can trailer them in. If the town in the future becomes four wheeler friendly, then this gives a area where those folks that bring in fifty thousand dollars worth of four wheelers can then put their sixty thousand dollar camper on the lot. <laughs> I think honestly. Um, I think there's something that we should look at because a lot of the all the stuff that we had going on last year was actually on privately owned land. It was. You know, and that was a that was a huge issue at some places and we all know where they're at. Right? We don't have to even give descriptions. You know, it's one of those things where I mean, I hate to be this strict, right? Just just an idea. I mean, I don't think there should be a tent set up in the city for more than seventy two hours. I mean, unless it's a designated campground area. Well, to add, um, let's take ATVs out of the picture, if you will, and let's talk about bicycles. Uh, the trailhead for the Bailey's Trail is expected to open this fall in Doneville. 
And uh, currently the only opening is in Chansey right now. And Chansey's already seeing um, a lot of traffic and, and folks coming out there and filling up parking lots and everything else. So it's it's really starting to take off. And, uh, you know, we on the ORCA board, we believe that this is going to be a destination for many people out of state. So providing places to camp would be a very oh, wise or, or a hotel in the Eagles building or a hotel period in town would be really good. Oh my God. Good plug. And of course, a lot of people have campers and a lot of ATV folks and bicycle people. I've talked to them. They've come into the city it's building. Okay. They've asked, hey, is there a place where I can next year if I want to bring my camper and camp out? Is there a campground? here because a lot of people with the COVID stuff a lot of folks aren't renting motels or staying in condos they're you know what was it I read an article that camper sales is skyrocketed since the COVID um, and let's be honest it's a lot cheaper to have a camper and go on vacation than it is to rent a safer. condo and safer, safer you know and, and you can take your pets or whatever but do not discourage the hotel people you know it's a very nice place to stay yeah, right there is options and there is room to add B, C clause, B, you know, yeah, to yeah. add to this. I, I like to start because it looks really good. Yeah, so. And that's it, folks. That's it. Sorry. Don't get her started. She said this enough. All right. All right. She, she leaves you a little meat on the bone. Well, it's, uh, it's been an eventful two weeks, um, but productive nonetheless. Um, I've been spending most of my time trying to, and, and everybody's been great. All the department heads. Scott's been, been amazing. Uh, Becky's been great. Uh, Chief Harry Barber's been great. Everybody's really, I'm trying to bridge the gaps that was, uh, I think, uh, needed to be com bridged for communication purposes to work together. I think... We're slowly, you know, that's starting to happen. I mean, we're the departments are interacting. I think we're not being told a lot more than what they ever had in the past. Um, we have, you know, I'm, I'm trying to implement some new ideas. Well, um, they're not original ideas overall in law enforcement. They're what I consider basic law enforcement functions that I think was a little bit lacking with the Nelsonville Police Department. Um, we have two new hires on the way. I'm very excited about them. They, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with both these individuals. They're both young, energetic, um, very professionally minded uh, young men. Uh, we've also got in, uh, approximately two dozen applications, and I've gotten uh, numerous other texts and uh, phone calls from other people that hasn't actually applied yet, but has expressed serious interest. Uh, so, you know, there's a good candidate pool out there, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I think we're going to be able to have an opportunity to pick some really qualified people. Uh, I know that uh, Becky's working on, you know, setting up eventually here, you know, sometime in the very near future, the, the examinations to the civil service, uh, things like that. So that's exciting. <clears throat> right now, I'm also working. We've worked uh, in the two weeks. We've worked with, uh, we've scheduled, a, a, I'm going to say, an enforcement action with uh, the prosecutor's office, with Keller Blackburn's office and uh, his investigators. We've been working with adult parole authorities. We've made several arrests with them in the last, you know, in the two weeks I've been here. Um, we've also made several independent drug arrests. Um, so I like the way that we're heading. It's just uh, getting guys used to it, creating a little bit of a new culture, a new attitude, a different mindset, um, being much more proactive as opposed to reactive. I think the guys have been really receptive and are eager to do a lot of things that I think that the, has been neglected in the past. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a fresh idea and a, a little bit of exuberance in them, so I'm excited about that. Um, I've been out riding with the guys. I've been trying to do everything I can to get out there with them and, and meet them and get to know them individually and then get to know me as well, uh, let them know what I'm expecting of them, put it all out there to them. We're in the process of cleaning from top to bottom, the entire office and organizing and inventorying uh, office of, uh, in charge of evidence room, things of that nature, training, all that has to be you know, reassigned to other people. So I'm, I'm in the process of doing that. Um, we're kind of going to a little more of a, in my opinion, a little more of a professional looking uniform. Um, it's it's going to be modified from what it currently is. Uh, I think that's, you know, a necessity. That's a good step in the right direction. 
Uh, I think it's more practical and professional looking as opposed to the way the other ones look was a little more tactically minded. Um, so I'm excited about that. Again, I um, still have issues. You know, one of the things that Scott and I have been working on is, you know, there's a, there's a disconnect there with the dispatching at the Nelsonville Police Department. That's one of the biggest problems that I, that I truly see initially because my biggest fear is calls for service. I'm spending most of my days when I'm sitting and when I'm in my office cleaning and organizing and inventorying, answering telephone calls that's coming in. And I've been encouraging guys, the officers, to be out and highly visible in patrol to not be in the office as much unless there's a need for them to be there to meet with somebody to take a complaint. Um, but that phone rings constantly. Um, and I'm afraid what I'm finding is in a short period of time is we'll get a call back and somebody will say, well, you know, I've waited on you or I'll go to the call with the officer. Like we'll check the voicemail and they're like, I called an hour and a half ago. And well, I can assure them that, well, those officers has been on calls the entire hour and a half, but we didn't get it. They didn't have an opportunity to get that call because there was nobody dispatching them other than through voicemail. So when we roll in there, it looks like we just waited an hour and a half. And so I can see a little bit of the public's frustration. And I think a lot of it's justified. I, I would like to figure out a solution to that to where somebody could be accountable for the, answering the phones, somebody, non-officers, and then could be dispatched in a proper manner in a timely fashion. Um, I think that's a, a definitely a big issue with uh, providing a little bit of better public service to the people of Nelsonville. I think they deserve that um, because a lot of times officers are getting criticized and, and I can assure you a lot of times it's not their fault. So. Those are things, though, that need corrected, in my opinion. That's one thing that I know Scott and I is both trying to come up with some solutions on. We've got some ideas out there, and there's some, some things in the works. Um, again, cleaning the office, getting the office, you know, with some better equipment, some things like that. The vehicles are very nice. Um, we're trying to ramp up taking care of them and having them, you know, well taken care of. And, of course, the maintenance has always been done, but as far as the appearance of them. Um, I'm getting some training set up. I'm um, having an evidence room audit also uh, from the evidence that basically the evidence room is I inherited it. I'm trying to get it set up to where somebody's an independent agency is going to come in and do a complete audit from top to bottom so we can be assured that everything that needs to be there is supposed to be there. I'm inventorying all of our current equipment uh, to find out what we have and what we don't have. If there's missing things, I want them documented, things like that. Um, and I'm just trying to set up a lot, a lot of things. Uh, I'm creating a storage room. We're taking some of the storage of old records from the Nelsonville Police Department. We're moving them over to where the street department was in one of them vacant rooms. It's, it's a nice storage room, uh, and that'll give us a little bit more space that I'm going to keep, like, equipment and everything in. So that's that's going to be nice. Um, really, uh, I've got a meeting with – I've been meeting. I've talked with all the prosecutor's office uh, attorneys, uh, other law enforcement agencies in the area. You know, Sheriff Smith's been great. Um, everybody's working well. I got a meeting with the warden of the Southeast Ohio Regional Jail next, the first of next week. He's the one that I haven't spoken with. Well, we've spoken on the telephone, but we're actually having a formal meeting next week. Uh, a lot of things, you know, I've found some better ways that we can work together with other agencies, which I think is a big plus because, you know, those were a lot of resources that I don't think we was utilizing. We'd be in the Nelsonville Police Department. Uh, because it better serves the citizens. And, they, you know, the, the more law enforcement present we have, in my opinion, the better. Um, but we're taking kind of a zero tolerance on, on drugs uh, and uh, people causing disruptions with that. Uh, anytime we're finding needles or, or any type of, you know, narcotics illegally, uh, we're charging people, we're arresting them, we're trying to we're putting them in jail. Uh, and again, like I said, that's happened multiple times now. So I'm, I like to see that, the proactivity. So uh, we've also been working a bunch of, abandoned vehicles that's on the roadways. Uh, there's, there's a, seems to be an abundance of that. There's, and that's, there's abundance. And so we've been uh, towing those vehicles and getting them out of there. And the homeowners have been very receptive to that. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure they're very appreciative. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not here to be critical of anything, but, you know, in the past, this, these very same homeowners have been told that, you know, those vehicles cannot be towed. But if they've been abandoned and left there for, for weeks on end, I have no problem towing them. Um, so we're getting them out of the way and cleaning that up a little bit. So again, we're just trying to provide a little bit of a better, you know, public service to them. I, I, I appreciate the input I've been getting out there and talking to as many people as I can. 
uh, business owners, employees, citizens, and uh, hearing their complaints. And a lot of them, you know, are echoing the other complaints. They're a lot of the same things. And so I'm trying to remedy all those. And I have no doubt that we're going to do that. Um, there's no doubt. Uh, it's not a difficult fix. It's just going to take some time to change that culture to give the citizens what they want. Um, so I, I'm very, I'm very confident that we're going to get there. I'm very excited about the new guys, uh, some energetic blood. So I'm, I'm, you know, just moving forward day at a time, each day trying to take a step in the right direction. So. Ooh, nice to hear it. So, so we're going to untie your hands a little bit because you know I understand that there is this list of thirty big offenders in Nelsonville that oh, you yes. know, we were told not to follow subjects in the mayor's court for any reason whatsoever. Well, guess what? Very nice. You do what you need to do. do what you need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Bring them on. Have a listen. They will no longer exist for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Do whatever you need to. So what we need from you folks for PD, uh, for our two new officers inbound and for chief as well, uh, we have, uh, there's no money left on the current PD budget for uniforms. They're approximately $2,400, $2,500 each. So that would be $7,500 for three sets of uniforms. Uh, we have collected up uniforms of the folks that are left and the serviceable stuff that is there, we are going to use, reuse. However, a lot of it is not serviceable or doesn't line up with the size folks that left versus coming in. Uh, I just want to reassure you that we didn't just throw that stuff away or leave it with the folks that left. We're doing everything we can to pinch pennies, but we would need $7,500 just to get started with the three we have. The other thing to, I wanted to plant a seed so the, we got an update that our second cruiser will probably be here in about maybe next week at the first part of the week after. Yes. So our, our second cruiser is coming in. Luckily, there's extra money on the grant. Uh, it's always been there for equipment for that cruiser. And uh, Chief's looking at a couple different things. Originally, we had slated an extra radio that would have been sitting on the shelf just as a backup. Um, we talked and it doesn't seem to be a very common problem to lose radio. So uh, we're going to look at, he's going to look at other options that will work good for uh, the cruiser, whether it be a, a laser, radar, or whatever, yeah, whatever he needs. Is radar that works? Um, I'm just curious. I heard a rumor. Well, I've, I've checked them. Um, there, there, is, there is one that works very well. Um, the other ones are kind of hit and miss. So one of the things that I was checking is I was doing some pricing, talking to some different companies the last couple of days. Uh, on pricing and essentially with the money that we believe is still there in the grant, we can actually equip um, each one of the, including the new vehicle that's coming in, the cruiser, all with new radars. Nice. Um, so, you know, that would give, and again, with me encouraging, you know, a little more traffic enforcement, uh, I think that would be, be a step in the right direction. Agreed. So the follow on to that with getting the second new cruiser in, the original plan is always to be uh, to take the oldest cruiser yeah. and make that the chief's vehicle. That was pre smashing the last one through a building and a porch. So uh, we still have the previous chief's vehicle, but it is very finicky to say the least. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just never know if it's going to start or not. The, the folks back there, one of the officers that left, he did a great job at you know, trying to get that thing running. But uh, that was the original plan was to move one of those older cruisers to make the Chiefs vehicle. What, what could we get from the insurance company on one cruiser? We don't have a final number yet, but it's going to be in the ballpark of 15. We should be able to get a, a, a decent vehicle for that. Is that right? I mean, I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. you know. So, well, that's what I was going to. That out there. That's what I was going to ask of council, you know, to uh, if if that's something that we can pursue, start looking around. Um, I know I've, when I've talked to Chief, the biggest thing is just make sure it's black to match our other vehicles. There you go. Of course, yeah. we would stripe it. It doesn't need to be a police cruiser, which costs significantly more because he's not going to be necessarily hauling folks to jail and have this stuff in the back. It just needs to be a marked vehicle, light bar on top, and um, can we forget anything. anything. The Jeep light bar, we can save all that stuff. Yeah. All that stuff will be saved and yeah. put on Basically, the next vehicle. Put that on. Yeah. Yeah, we're, the stuff that's on the old Jeep will not be just discarded. It'll be kept. And, and, and take what you can off that wreck cruiser. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a silver rod. There's a tan. I don't know if he's ready for that raw power. <laughs> I've actually talked to a couple dealerships already, just kind of uh, socializing our idea. Yeah. And we've gotten 
uh, we, we got a decent response or, I mean, actually a really good response and just a bunch of different vehicles, you know, to choose if you, from. If you talk to Taylor, if you talk to Hugh White, call Billy, Baggert, Lancaster, just call. Roger that. I just wanted to bring that to you folks. We don't have the check yet, but is that something you would consider taking sure. the council for approval to yeah, get chief of vehicles? Because we have four, four, with the new cruiser coming, we'll have four cruisers, right? Right. Yes, sir. And then you're going to buy a used vehicle to replace the cruiser that was smashed. Essentially, that would have been the chief's vehicle, right. so which replaced the old Jeep that we just keep pumping yeah, money into. Uh, so we sell the Jeep or donate it or whatever. I don't know. I think, you know, maybe if we can call some of these uh, other dealerships around and say, hey, <clears throat> this is what we got. Can you donate something to the city? Absolutely. I didn't want to go too far down the rabbit hole until I brought it to you folks for discussion to see if there's even any appetite to move forward on something like that. And uh, now that there's a desire to move forward, I can definitely do more fishing. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. So when do you when do you expect the final number from your insurance company? Mm, not real sure. How old was that vehicle? Four years. The one they smashed. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head. I'd, it's well, I it's it a sixteen or fifteen, if yeah, I recall correctly. I was correctly. thinking it was four or five years old. It's a twenty fifteen. Oh well, then yeah. yes, that's exactly it's in line with the normal price. And, and I think we're, we're going to be within five hundred dollars. It's going to be, he said, around fifteen, fifteen five. So I, I, I'm pretty confident that's going to be a pretty good number, somewhere in there. But he hadn't figured out the exact totals yet. Well, if there's any dealerships out there watching, if they'd like to help out the city of Nelsonville, it'd be nice. We can give the red coat truck. <laughs> Just hope you ain't gotta go up a hill. <laughs> hope he's not chasing someone. Uh, so I don't, Chief. Am I forgetting anything that we needed to request funds for at this time? No, sir. So I was just basically seventy five hundred for uniforms. uniforms. Uh, also, keep in mind his operating budget is extremely low due to paying okay. the forty thousand dollar body cans that we had to go back to make the annual payment of seventy seven thousand or whatever it was. That should only be a seven yeah, so that should only be a seven thousand dollar bill though. Well the budget correct it was I was yeah. just highlighting the total expense and uh the seven thousand came from three different line items within the budget already. And unfortunately the budget uh we're only halfway through the year but it's been largely exhausted in many different ways. Uh, specifically, I believe Taylor sent an email about the part-time budget and needing to move monies into there. Um, for, but it was not adding from anything. It was pulling from within the police budget over to the part-time. Uh, that one has been 80 or 85% exhausted, that yes. funding line already. So, and then, of course, the continuous overtime question, which I assure you is absolutely being addressed. Yeah. Rome wasn't built today. Uh, so basically, also got a seventy five hundred dollar appropriation, and then we'll take the finance. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, we're fine with that. And then, who do you think you need it for operation? Because that can't come out of capital improvement. That's going to have to go through finance, not right? Come out of general fund. Uh, Chief, do you have? I know it's quick. I'm putting you on the spot. Do you have any idea? What kind of money you're going to need for operating expense, or well, should we hold off for it right now? I would hate. I would. I'd rather hold off right now. Taylor and I are throwing some ideas around, and with a lot of changes in personnel right now, it's really hard to factor in because they're coming in for some different rates and where our vacancies are and things like that. Some guys are going to need family coverage. Some guys are not. So there's a lot of variables in there that we just don't know right now. Okay. But I am trying to work on it. Absolutely. Okay. Do we have anything else? Harry, you got anything you want to add? Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. We'll call this meeting to an end then at 7.55. Five minutes till finance meeting.